Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's HIS Talk webinar, Improve Efficiency, Reduce Burnout, Leveraging Smart Clinical Communications. It's brought to you by Spoke. I'm Lori from HIS Talk and I'll be moderating. We have two speakers today. First up will be Matt Mesnick, MD. Matt is the Chief Medical Officer at Spoke. Joining Matt will be Kylie Black, who is the Director of Clinical Innovation at Spoke. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Matt. Thank you. So during today's call, we want to cover um, topics of trying to identify the most common clinical technology contributors to clinician burnout, as well as recognize how improving workflows increases care team collaboration and mitigates increased workload unrelated to direct patient care, as well as explain how clinical communication platforms simplify finding care team members and pulling actionable information out of the EHR. In 2007, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, or IHI, launched the Triple AIM initiative. It was designed to optimize health system of performance. The goal of the Triple AIM was to improve patient care experience, improve the health of a population, and to reduce healthcare costs. While this model has worked great in guiding the optimization of health systems since its inception, more recently, an additional aspect has been adopted and that's improved clinician experience, leading to the creation of the quadruple aim in 2014. This is an idea that without an improved clinician experience, on the provider side, the other three patient-centric aspects won't reach their full potential. Each of the components of the triple aim are critical in optimizing health system performance, but one crucial aspect was missing, the care providers themselves. As value-based, care becomes more prevalent, the quality of care that is provided becomes essential, and it all starts with the provider. The pressure that is put on care providers is immense, leading to unwanted outcomes that can negatively impact and affect the quality of care provided. According to Medscape's 2018 Annual Physician Lifestyle Report, 42% of physician respondents reported burnout. Where does clinical communication fit into the quadruple aim? First and foremost, communication plays a tremendous role in improving patient outcomes in areas like patient safety and satisfaction. Whether it be with regards to clinician response times, patient admit times, or patient care, things like bedside monitors and nurse call, these are all directly impacted by communication. Health system costs can be impacted by the waste and inefficiencies caused by disparate systems and islands of information they can create in the healthcare system. Critical information from systems such as the EHR, lab information, and radiology information systems, and more, needs to be able to be shared across the health system for faster communications, efficiency, and care quality. The patient experience and patient satisfaction are influenced by many factors, but communications is at the core. Audible alarms and overhead paging create noisy environment that can be disrupted to sleep and healing. Additionally, disjointed communications can cause patients to wait for everything from pain relief to discharge orders. Non-actionable alerts and alarms, administrative tasks, and other communication challenges take physicians and nurses away from the point of care and contribute to their fatigue, frustration, and burnout. These communication challenges have an impact on all four elements of the quadruple A. Next slide, please, Kylie. In April of 2019, Spoke conducted its first survey on clinician burnout. But as we all know, the situation become far more acute with the onset of the pandemic. In July of 2021, we revisited the clinician burnout topic by adding several burnout-related questions to our annual state of healthcare communication survey. We've used the responses from that survey to dive deep into the implica implications of burnout to help provide a better understanding of the impact of the pandemic on your staff and ultimately on patient care. To create this report, we surveyed healthcare professionals in July of 2021. More than 200 executives, physicians, nurses, IT personnel, contact center representatives, and more from around the United States responded. They provided some eye-opening input about the state of communication at their organization. Next slide, please. The stress of being a healthcare provider can't be overstated. In recent years, it has become more complex and stressful, especially during the pandemic. The list of administrative tasks, patient care needs, 
have increased exponentially with the added concerns to personal safety with COVID. Burnout was always a problem, but now its impact on hospital care teams, executives, and contact center staff has exacerbated it even more. By definition, burnout is a long-term stress reaction marked by emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a lack of sense of personal accomplishment. Research on the mental health implications among healthcare workers during the pandemic is still emerging. Yet risk factors for burnout have magnified by extreme high demands, lack of control, resource scarcity, and possible ethical dilemmas. Studies show that more than 50% of providers describe experiencing burnout, and this continues to increase. Next slide. This slide shows the symptoms of burnout and burnout's impact on healthcare. One organization even termed it burn over because the situation has moved from beyond burnout to for, for many exhausted by the pandemic. Burnout tends to be ignored until it impacts KPIs, especially direct costs on the balance sheet. You know, one of the areas that always gets me is that gap between what care providers want to provide versus what they can provide. And that really creates, it, creates quite an emotional and a personal dilemma. Next slide. We asked our survey participants, to what degree have you personally experienced feelings of work-related stress and or loss satisfaction, sense of efficacy that might contribute to burnout in your work? About 80% of the healthcare professionals who participated in the survey personally reported experiencing those feelings. 54% of those said that they were considerable or a great deal. One study noted burnout was linked to a higher incidence of physicians self-reporting medical er errors. As clinicians experiencing worsening symptoms of career dissatisfaction, they are more likely to leave medicine mid-career, resulting in an increase in healthcare costs and a shortage of qualified professionals. Replacing a physician can cost anywhere from $250,000 to a million dollars, depending on their specialty, and can take at least six to 12 months to find a replacement if you can find one. Replacing a nurse runs between $28,000 and $52,000 as, as, if you can find one as well. In 2019, turnover reduced productivity and other burnout related factors cost the healthcare industry between $2.6 billion and $6.3 billion annually, and that's before the pandemic. With COVID, there has been a huge increase in the use of travel nurses to plug nursing staffing holes. Travel nurses run around $8,000 per week compared to $1,500 per week for hospital employed nurses. Next slide, please. Sadly, levels of burnout among healthcare professionals have increased as a result of the COVID pandemic. Approximately 92% of all respondents believe levels of burnout have increased at least moderately since the pandemic began. In the past, we noted the lion's share of the focus around burnout was on physicians, nurses, and other care team members within hospitals and healthcare systems. Now we see that other roles and functions are also reporting feelings that contribute to burnout. Additionally, contact center staff or operator services moved to the front lines during the pandemic as call volume skyrocketed. Suddenly, phone communications became more important than ever. Next slide. Techno <clears throat> excuse me. Technology plays a significant role in provider dissatisfaction and burnout. Burdensome or increased workload not related to direct patient care and poor integration into clinical workflows are the most common clinical technology contributors to clinician burnout as well as alarm fatigue. Next slide, please. As the former chief medical officer of an EHR company, I love EHRs and what they offer. While EHRs have the potential to make significant contributions to patient safety and enhance care, and for care coordination, they have also radically altered and disrupted established clinical workflows, including physician-patient interactions. EHRs have become a source of interruptions and distractions and are very time intensive. The demands of EHR documentation cut into provider patient time, as well as provider family and free time. Many providers wind up continuing their clinical documentation at home 
or after hours in the clinic and the hospital. The High Tech Act of 2009 resulted in the rapid deployment and incorporation of EHRs into hospitals and clinics with a promise of improving healthcare quality and efficiency. The EHR is a fantastic data repository, but it is passive. A chore for providers and staff in, to document in. It's also a great source of data analytics, clinical decision support, clinical alerts, but it's not efficient. For example, in order to view a patient alert like an abnormal test result, you need to first log into the EHR and then that patient's record. Why not receive a message on your smartphone with the abnormal result for that patient instead? Later, we'll discuss ways to leverage the EHR functionalities by automating clinical workflows by taking passive EHR data and making it actionable with a smart clinical communications platform. Next slide. This study from the American Journal of Emergency Medicine asked the question, just how long are physicians actually spending on the computer? As well as a necessary follow-up question of what if physicians use that time to interact with patients instead? The study analyzed physician computer usage at a community hospital ED. They noted that the total mouse clicks approached 4,000 during a busy 10 hour shift for, per provider. Quantified another way, the average percentage of time spent on data entry was 43%, with 28% in direct patient contact. Emergency department physicians spend significantly more time entering data into the EHR than any other activity, including direct patient care. Next slide. So let's consider the role of technology in burnout. We asked the question, when you consider your experience with clinical tools and technology, do any of the following contribute to the risk of alarm fatigue or clinician burnout? According to survey respondents, the two most common clinical technology contributors were burdensome or increased workload not related to direct patient care and poor integration into clinical workflows. These were also the top two contributors in 2019 in our 2019 clinician burnout report and also our 2020 state of healthcare report. Obviously, there's a trend here. Next slide. When it comes to technology, we are learning that it's a double-edged sword. It can be both the problem and the cure. Clinical decision support is great, but it can also lead to extra burden chasing alerts and alarms needlessly. For example, an integrated, well-designed EHR solution can be a significant factor in preventing burnout. Workflows which lighten the burden with the right information at the right time can lead to practice efficiencies. Optimizing EHRs to promote usability and clinical efficiency may help, cur help to curb burnout. Adopting advanced workflow technologies which employ automation can lighten the burden on healthcare providers. Next slide, please, Kylie. There is hope. Respondents weighed in on remedies with improving workflow efficiency and data exchange, taking the top spots for recommended solutions. The good news is that 73% of providers, provider executives in a PwC Health Institute research report stated that, that they are focusing on automating administrative tasks to improve, improve the clinician experience. Implementing an intuitive clinical communication platform that simplifies the process of finding care team members and pulling actionable information from the EHR is one step toward decreasing stress and streamlining information-driven workflows. Next slide, please. Clinical workflows are the sequence of physical and mental tasks performed by various people within, the, within and between work environments. Healthcare delivery involves a series of interconnected clinical, administrative, and population level workflows that occur before, during, and after a patient encounter. Clinical workflows are aimed at improving the functionality of the healthcare system with the ultimate purpose of streamlining the process and offering patients the best health experience possible. Streamlining and customizing a workflow can reduce EHR clicks and cut down on time spent in front of the computer screen. Customization of clinical workflows is key since no two hospitals work the same way. Care team collaboration is essential. Your workflow needs to leverage care team collaboration. This leads to improved clinical efficiency. 
spending more time on patient care rather than administrative tasks. A robust, fully integrated clinical communication platform fills the communication and collaboration gaps in the EHR by connecting care teams and systems to improve workflows and deliver information quickly and securely into the hands of those who need it to act on it. Next slide. Integrated healthcare technology can actually be the solution needed to help improve and simplify care team workflows by reducing the stressors that contribute to burnout. Having an integrated, well-designed clinical communication and collaboration or CCNC platform solution with an EHR can be a significant factor in preventing burnout, as well as reducing gaps in care and increased quality compliance. Next slide, please. Let's talk about automating clinical workflow. Workflows help drive the complex work of care teams, and by automating intelligent clinical workflows, a smart clinical communication and collaboration platform can help care teams streamline patient care processes and standardize on best practices. Automation can support and replace manual work and help identify and accelerate efficiencies in healthcare. A workflow engine can take alerts from the EHR and other clinical systems like LIS and RIS and escalating when necessary to ensure faster response to patient needs. Next slide. Workflows help drive the complex work of care teams and drive action by connecting teams with the people and information they need. They help care teams streamline patient care processes and standard, uh, standardize on best practices. An intelligent workflow engine can automate alerts from the EHR and clinical systems, escalating when necessary, ensuring fast response to patient needs. You need flexible templates which can be easily configured to support best practices and maximize the benefits of clinical process automation. Now over to you, Kylie. <clears throat> Thanks, Matt. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about improving workflows. And I'd like to start with a slide that most people have um, experienced in their, clinical, um, in their clinical lives. And so this slide kind of goes through the trying to connect one clinician with another clinician. And we're talking about a nurse here. So we start with the nurse thinking, who am I having to contact? Um, what department is that person in? And why am I contacting them? So in this case, let's say the patient needs a change in their um, medication and the nurse has to contact the physician or the care provider that's taking care of that patient. So as we continue down the flow here, what's the priority in which I have to contact that, that provider? What day and time is it? And let's be honest, when you're working a 12 hour shift, you lose track of time uh, very quickly. And then is that person on call? So now you've got to look up a call schedule. Let's say it's 2 a.m. in the morning and the patient needs um, something for blood pressure or they're having some chest pain and you need an additional order. So you have to now look up the whoever's on call for that service and then also think about what device do they use. So some places use just pagers, other places use a mix of devices, personal devices or hospital issued devices. Um, and maybe do text messaging instead of paging. So you can see throughout this, there's all these different steps that the clinician has to think about when they wanna connect with the person so that they can give the information to that person where and when it matters the most. Let's look at a couple of different examples for uh, clinical workflows and how technology can help uh, increase that uh, satisfaction amongst clinicians. So the first one I'm gonna look at is an activation of a code team. And if we look at this, we're gonna really look at a rapid response. So how to quickly and reliably notify staff during situations that require that rapid response team. We can send notifications to any device and we rely on the delivery of your communication when time really is, is of the essence. Um, Let's see it in action here. So you can see that they are searching, the nurse that is taking care of the patient is now starting to search 
in a global directory for the rapid response team. And you'll see they selected that rapid response team. Notice below that it lists all of the people who are currently signed in and are in that care team role that are for the rapid response team. So the nurse is generating a message, and you'll notice this is a critical chat. She's saying respiratory, res or excuse me, rapid response team, room 356, patient is Todd Jones. He's got acute kidney injury. He's having some difficulty breathing on BiPAP, and he's decompensating rapidly. So as we can see, the team members on the rapid response start to respond or text back to this message. And you'll see that Jeff, who's the respiratory therapist, is on his way. And Sarah, one of the nurses, is looping in their doctor that's on for the rapid response team. They've already added Dr. Hopper to the chat. And the other nurse that's on the rapid response team is on their way. So Dr. Hopper is now in the chat, and he wants to know what the patient's latest vitals are. That nurse who's at the bedside can quickly type a message, or they can have someone else type the message and they send the, the, um, the vitals quickly to the team um, as they're on their way to help assist with the patient. You'll notice that another physician's been added to the chat, and this is Dr. Singh. Dr. Hopper actually says, I, we have a possible intubation needed. Um, can you please assist? And so that Dr. Hopper has now added another provider to the discussion without having to make any further calls to anesthesiology, or to overhead page for a stat intubation, they actually are able to loop that person in right away. And Dr. Singh replies that they'll be there in about two minutes. So at the end of the entire episode, Dr. Hopper is able to provide that closed loop communication. So he says, Dr. excuse me, Todd Jones went down and received his hemodialysis catheter. He's going for a dialysis run and then he's being transferred to the ICU. And he sends out a thank you to his team. So how does this work? What if Todd Jones was becoming septic? So let's say the patient's vitals are being entered into the EHR um, and they are actually outside a normal range for an event. That EHR is continually monitoring the vital changes and they calculate an elevated mu score, which is an indication of sepsis. So an alert is set, alert is sent, excuse me, to the sepsis triage nurse or, or the response team's preferred devices. Um, and spokes, so first of all, spoke receives that sepsis alert and they trigger that workflow action. The workflow action is then that alert that goes out to a specified team or specified clinician. And um, Spoke's clinical application, we allow to manage sepsis uh, response tests at every different step along the way. Now the rapid response team is beginning their intervention right away. They're at that patient's bedside. Maybe the lab person is included on that, that sepsis triage nurse um, uh, group and they're drawing their blood cultures. And so as you can see, we're able to escalate a situation that really, again, time is of the essence. So the key benefits here, obviously, one is improving patient outcomes. We don't want Todd Jones to get septic. And two, we're improving that clinician satisfaction. So there's not all these phone tag um, games playing or you're not paging someone waiting for a response. You're not having to call down to lab saying, where is my technician? I need these blood draws drawn. Um, again, it's a seamless communication and you can set this workflow up to be very automated. So I'll turn this over to Matt to discuss uh, a use case of this. Thanks, Kylie. And you know, let's take that uh, sepsis uh, workflow and now um, uh, describe uh, an actual implementation and, and uh, what uh, having a clinical communication integration to an EHR can help accomplish. The University of Utah Health launched a sepsis initiative to evaluate their sepsis response workflow and determine how they could both better identify when patients are showing signs of sepsis and more quick, quickly rally their rapid response team for treatment with a goal to improve their sepsis mortality rates. The process they had in place previously involved a nurse writing down vital signs then entering them into the EHR, sometimes in a delayed manner. The nurse would then have to make a judgment call about the patient's condition, if vital signs were out of range, and could decide to manually page 
the rapid response team for assistance. This step intensive process wasn't very efficient and had the potential for error. Nurses needed an easier method for contact instead of having to manually page teams for assistance. Next slide, please. Uh, University of Utah, by implementing this um, clinical workflow, uh, was able to reduce the mortality rate for patients with sepsis by 20% by integrating their EHR with uh, a clinical communication platform. Previously, abnormal vital signs could go undetected for several days. They would be in the EHR notes, but the communication wasn't nearly urgent enough for a patient experiencing signs of sepsis. Now an EHR best practice alert calculates MU scores from vital signs. If that MU score is elevated, Spoke automatically takes that alert and delivers it to the charge nurse. And those are for the cases where they have lower scores that are less critical or delivers the, uh, or activates a sepsis response team. And those are for higher MU scores that are for patients that are higher risk. This new approach has saved many lives at the University of Utah Health. Back to you, Kylie. Okay, thanks, Matt. Let's look at another um, different workflow that we can use with a CC and C platform. So let's talk about mobilizing orders from the EHR. And um, this is a, a technology where thereby an order is placed into the EHR, but the person who is taking care of that patient doesn't always have to keep logging back in into the EHR inbox. Um, to see those um, alerts or those messages. So now they have time sensitive alerts and messages that are delivered directly to their device, um, whether it be a SpectreLink phone or a um, BYOD a smartphone. We can make those alerts and those messages more actionable and thereby exchange time sensitive clinical data. So let's take a look and seeing this in action. Here we see um, on the screen, this is a pulmonology consultation. So this message was sent as an alert to the doctor, Dr. Lindstrom, who is the pulmonologist. And you can see that the patient's information is listed there, the location, where they're at, and the physicians that are requesting it. Now, you can also notice the date and the time, penicillin, and if you could, were able to scroll down, you'd get more clinical data on the patient. But at the end of the screen is where I want you to draw uh, your, your attention to. So here we have um, an alert reminder that's being sent again to that consulting physician, and they have the ability to accept it or decline it. And if they decline this consult, let's say the pulmonologist is currently in doing bronchoscopies um, and they are not able to see this patient. They could decline this alert or this order that, and that would then, then be escalated based on the workflow that you designed out to perhaps um, Dr. Lindstrom's partner, or it'd be escalated to the NP that is currently in the hospital that's seeing consults for that day. And so as you look at this, you know, again, a consult order is placed uh, in the EHR, and we wanna make sure that that correct physician receives a secure notification. Um, spoke then detects that consult order event and it triggers again that workflow. And as we continue to do that, we can connect those physicians. So let's say that Dr. Lindstrom accepted that consult. They now have the ability to securely text with the um, ordering provider and get some more clinical information or maybe ask some questions about the patient. And again, to this degree, they're starting to do the care planning for the patient. Um, again, we allow for that secure messaging, and then we also maintain an audit trail. So if there is a root cause analysis that needs to happen, we have the ability to go back and look at red messages or alerts that were declined and provide that data to the institution should they need it. Finally, consults and med treatments can begin more quickly, and this is used, uh, spoke clinical application is used to collaborate with the care team as needed. So let's say this patient also had to go down for a procedure or for a scan. The um, order, excuse me, the consulting physician, Dr. Lindstrom, now has access to that patient's care team plan, care team, and can text with the nurse saying, what time is the patient scheduled for the scan? Or I'll be up there in approximately 10 minutes. So we can coordinate that care 
uh, for the whole care team for the patient. So the key benefits here, again, we're eliminating that phone tag, we're reducing the dial zero calls, and we track those messages in an audit trail. Let me give you an example of a workflow that we did in real life for consultation. Uh, there's a uh, facility that we work with called Tidal Health Peninsula Regional. Uh, they're located in Maryland and their flagship hospital is, is uh, again, Peninsula Regional. It's a level two, a 300 bed facility. They have many, many ED visits um, and the average time for their ED arrival to the hospital bed, which was 340 minutes, which is outside of um, the parameters of uh, some measurements, some, uh, bench, some national benchmarking. So their challenges that they had is they really needed to improve communication amongst the care team for the ED. So that's the ED providers, the ED case managers who were nurses and the hospitalists. And again, we wanted to communicate timely information to the right provider at the right time through the right device, all while, be, while being HIPAA compliant. And so what we ended up doing is implementing a workflow that really involved just group messaging, but also helped us um, manage their hospitalist consults. And the results that we found is we had a 44 minute uh, improvement in uh, boarding time. So we saved that patient 44 minutes. Boarding time is when the time to um, decision to admit to the time they actually get to their bed. Um, we also saw an overall 31 minute uh, reduction in ED length of stay. And I think the most important thing that we saw was we did a survey pre and post implementation. And we saw a 79% increase in hospitalist satisfaction with the overall admission process. And as you can see, there's a quote there from the chief quality officer and the hospitalist, Dr. Schneider, who really talked about creating the virtual huddle. And what happened with this workflow is that we were able to design a closed loop communication. So we also um, made it so that whoever was taking that consult, that, that hospitalist, had the ability to then talk back with the ED provider, similar to the um, uh, case example I gave you beforehand. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Matt. Thanks, Kylie. Let me just take a minute. I'd really like to tell you a little bit about Spoke as a company. We currently have more than 600 employees supporting our hospital and healthcare system employee, uh, customers. We provide services to more than 2,200 hospitals, large and small, public and private, adult and children's, academic and community. Spoke is a publicly traded company. We're profitable, have zero debt, and decades of experience in healthcare. We also have the nation's largest paging network. Currently, we send more than a million messages each month, and we have been rated number one for secure healthcare communications by Black Book Market Research for the last four consecutive years. Spoke and your EHR both have very important roles to play in your organization. Spoke can help optimize the significant expense investment you've made in your EHR by enhancing its functionality. For example, most EHRs can't communicate with those who don't have EHR access. But with Spoke, you can reach everyone in your enterprise. Another pain point we often hear from clinicians is the inconvenience of having to check their EHR inbox for orders and messages that need their attention. Spoke can automate the delivery of those notifications right to the device of their choice, eliminating the time and steps required to check their EHR inbox. As we mentioned earlier, Spoke helps augment key workflows established in your EHR by delivering and escalating notifications directly to the correct provider. And lastly, as healthcare organizations continue to expand and grow across ge geographical technological boundaries, Spoke can help ease the burden of uniting separate locations by providing reliable communication for care teams who may be operating in different EHRs. And next slide. As we've already discussed, Spoke enhances clinical workflows and care team collaboration. A few examples include integrating with nurse call systems to facilitate responding to patient requests, streamline orders by sending them directly to the providers who can deal with them, automating the delivery of lab and RAD test results to the ordering or on-call providers who can take action, and activating code and rapid response teams. 
SpokeGo drives action by delivering information to care teams when they need it, and importantly, adapts to their workflows. So this concludes the uh, didactic part of the presentation and, and uh, going back to you, Lori. Thank you, Matt. Um, we'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. As a reminder, please use the questions section on the GoToWebinar panel to submit your questions. Um, the first question, what are your thoughts on other ways a clinical communication and collaboration platform can help with provider burnout? Um, I could take this one. So I think there's, you know, endless use cases that we could come up with for helping with provider burnout and using a clinical collaboration and communication platform. Um, I think Matt highlighted a few of those, but one of the things that I'd like to point out is um, I really think that getting the information or using the, the um, group message uh, technology that we have and providing that closed loop communication uh, can be used in a variety of different ways. Um, let's say that you are the supervisor of the physical therapy department and you want to do patient assignments um, and every one of your physical therapists are currently physically located all over your healthcare facility. You can quickly reach them, give the patient assignments, you know that it's secure, you know that it's HIPAA compliant, um, and message out the group with one simple message versus having to um, track down your physical therapist. Um, you know, healthcare is, is rapidly changing and we tend to um, have to do a lot more with a lot less. And so any way that we can provide it to be simple, I follow the KISS method all the time, but make it simple for clinicians um, to communicate and get that essential data to the right person at the right time um, is, is the, the basis, I guess, of, of Spoke um, and um, our, our uh, clinical platform. One thing I'd add to that is just the, the whole notion of trying to, uh, and you talked about it with the communication between the ED and the hospitals that title health, is avoiding, avoiding phone tag. So there's uh, nothing that, um, certainly as an emergency physician that I hated more than um, trying to reach somebody. Uh, a lot of times, again, uh, there's also the self-service nature of having a, a robust clinical communication system where I don't need to contact the health unit coordinator or the nurse to put a page in to a specialist I may need want to talk to um, or a hospitalist and I may want to admit a patient to. I can directly, um, uh, through a spoke directory, uh, identify who's on call and message them directly and turn that into a phone conversation. Uh, I might be seeing a patient in the emergency department, um, talking to a cardiologist about this chest pain patient. I can immediately attach their EKG, a copy of their chest X-ray, an image, image of their chest X-ray, and we can have uh, a, a discussion about it without having to have gone through their answering service to find out who's on call and, uh, and play tag back and forth you know, and then get dragged out of a patient room um, you know, when, it, when it's not convenient. You know, I think that, you know, those are the types of things that as we move forward that really um, are frustrating to providers. Um, and then also, if you're a provider at home, um, you know, you don't want to have to, again, uh, respond to a page and then call a, a station in the hospital, be put on hold while you're trying to wrangle the, um, you know, the provider or to go over a lab result. Um, when you could have had that lab result just uh, texted directly to you to act upon. Thank you. Um, the next one, sorting through large amounts of information and finding the nuggets that apply to a particular patient situation is something that we thought the EHR ought to be good at, but we still have problems of knowing what data is important and what is the right treatment and prevention plan for each patient. What areas do you see in which CC and C systems can integrate with EHRs and lessen care providers' burden? Yeah, I think that this one is um, is also driven by there are certain best practices, um, but there are also certain uh, local uh, best practices. So that you know there are some national standards and and there are local ones. So as an example, um, you know there's lots of data as you said that's in an EHR. And the question is, which ones need to be acted upon um, and called attention to? So I think a classic example would be abnormal lab results. So um, 
I remember used to uh, there would be nurses on stations that would you know part of their job was kind of going through patient charts looking for abnormal normal lab results and then we had the lab uh, you know as time went on would, would would start to identify and call those out and then you'd then have this series of phone, of uh, the telephone game where the lab calls the the nursing station and then the nursing station then calls the provider and some of these are abnormal and some of these are markedly abnormal and which ones really mattered you know like so if you had a, a renal patient that had a slightly elevated potassium it probably didn't matter um, but if you had a uh, heart patient um, in telemetry with normal kidneys who had an elevated potassium then that probably then that matters and i think that these are the types of things that you can actually put rules engines behind that then um, can automate that whole notification process so now you're then calling attention to the provide to the provider and say like here is something that you need to deal with now and I'm going to present it to you without having to have you have to scan through their record when you're doing rounds that type of thing. Kylie, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I would add too. I think one of the things that nursing struggles with is making sure that the provider is is aware of um, situations that are happening with the patient. And so, for example. There are a lot of FYI information that we just want to pass on to the provider that doesn't necessarily require a reply back, but we want to make sure that that data or that information got to the provider. And so using um, the CC and C platform, you can simply type a quick message and you can see when that provider has read the message or not read it. You can even put in there FYI only, um, so I don't need a reply back. And I think that helps to simplify that communication. So for example, um, I'm, a lot of our post-op patients, they would wanna know what their hemoglobin was um, two hours or the, the morning of, um, or excuse me, the morning after surgery. And if that hemoglobin was fine, I would just say, hey, FYI hemoglobin was you know, 12.2. And I didn't need any response. I just wanted to make sure they were aware of the, of the result. Yeah, I think uh, just uh, in addition, so you might be uh, doing a wound check on a patient post-op and you saw something that, you know, was a little bit worrisome to you in terms of the amount of redness and drainage and things like that. You could just snap a picture and then send it to the provider uh, who may be, uh, you know, rounding in another hospital. And, um, and then, you know, instead of waiting for them to come, uh, you know, it might be several hours later to see that patient. So I think, you know, there's lots of, of things that you, really only your imagination is the only uh, boundary in terms of what you could do. Can you speak to the possible integration with QGenda as an organization's on-call tool? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the, you know, QGenda is a, is a great scheduling tool. And, um, and I think what's, you know, and we've integrated to it or in, in the process of integrating to it in uh, several different uh, versions of Spoke. And um, and we also have our own um, uh, on-call uh, platform as well. But the, the notion is that um, you know whether it's QGenda, Amion, Spoke, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, shift management, things like that. The um, the you know the, the a lot of times the it's it's what you're used to as an organization, and um, and and you know I think. The, the notion is that we'd like to be agnostic and integrate with those because the things that really help drive, you know, uh, the scheduling is great because that gives you a source of truth of who's on call and supposed to be on call. Uh, one of the things that, that somebody like Spoke does is we also have the directory that has all of the provider information in terms of how you get a hold of them. So it's one thing to have the, the direct, to have the schedule. It's another thing to have the directory so that you know how to get in touch with all those providers who are on call, like what's their preferred device, what's the preferred number, you know, um, during certain times of the day they want to be called versus paged or texts, um, that type of thing. So, you know, um, so integrating with those are, are really important, um, and there are different levels of of integration that you can have. And so, you know, I, I, again, I think every place is a little bit different, um, and uh, for some. They look for a all-in-one solution, and others they have. Uh... Okay, thank you. Um, Terry asks, this seems like it wouldn't be as efficient without a smartphone. Are you seeing more health systems adopt a BOD approach for nursing and ancillary staff? Yeah, we are, and uh, but I also see um, a hybrid approach. So that, you know, I think 
certainly on the provider side, it's, you know, providers, uh, it's all about, you know, bring your own device on the provider side. On the nursing side, I think it really depends on the facility and uh, and even the um, unit in the facility. So if you've got, um, you know, like if you're in the burn unit or if you're in, um, you know, isolation units, I think there's concern about devices going in and out of rooms um, and, you know, in, and trying to maintain some semblance of, of isolation where you might have, uh, you know, uh, voice over IP devices and whether they're SpectreLink or Zebra or things like that. Um, and those are uh, devices that might be used when you when you start your shift and then return at the end of the shift. So, but what I think what we're really seeing is as this evolves, going from pagers to to smartphones or other communication devices, that it really it seems to be morphing into a hybrid approach. I think the other thing that you just have to you know that we're all cognizant of is it really depends where you are to get paged. So. Um, you know, pagers are great, uh, especially in um, if you're trying to get somebody, get a hold of somebody in a, uh, a lead-lined room. Um, you know, short of a pager, I don't know how you do it too well. I mean, it's very difficult. Um, you know, in terms of it depends on the bandwidth uh, and the frequency that you're com communicating on. And then, in addition, you know, if somebody lives out in a remote area, um, you know, it all depends on the cell coverage. And also, and also depends on the number of, of the uh, of the wireless coverage as well in terms of uh, for paging. So each one is a little different and unique. And so I know that um, you know as much as we'd love to be able to get down to one device for providers, depending on their uh, situation, sometimes they're still going to have to have two. Can you um, talk about? Additional ways you could leverage or utilize CCNC to decrease burnout. Well, I think you know we we touched on a few of those. Um, you know, one thing to lessen burn. You know, it, it, you know, it, I always look at it in terms of trying to lessen the burden. And the burden is, you know, it, it, everything rolls downhill in healthcare. Um, and so I, you know, I look at, um, you know, the Group messaging, I think, as Kylie mentioned, is something that we probably don't take advantage of as much as we should. I think that uh, you know, one of the things that we're working on in, in development are is task management, uh, which is really just a kind of a modification of, of of text messaging, but you know, and that leverages the whole closed loop environment. So the notion being that instead of trying to contact an individual to do a specific function function, there may be a group of individuals, whether they're RTs or nursing assistants or health unit coordinators, that I can send a group message to, and whoever does it first takes it off of everybody else's work uh, work list. And so now we're really, you know, kind of dividing and conquering, um, you know. So those who, you know, and then we're we're kind of load balancing work work in the organization for those who are available to be able to do it, and when somebody else is busy, they don't have to, you know, they they don't get even more added to them just because they are the unit coordinator for that, that station. So I think that um, in, in addition, one of the things that we had talked about had to do with, um, you know, again, with, with closing the loop. And I think the one of the things we always worry about and that we wind up, um, I'm not going to say wasting time, but, you know, it's a whole notion like did I, when I sent a page out, did that provider get the page, you know, and then I'm repaging. And so these are, I think that's probably the most frustrating thing for everybody in an organization that's trying to get hold of somebody. They may have gotten the message, they couldn't respond because they were tied up doing something else, but they could at least, you know, you know, you can see that they received the message, you know, with the read, read receipts. They could text, you know, okay, or, you know, they accept the, 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 um, the, the note. Um, and so that you now are sitting there on the hook you know, and uh, wondering, did they get that or not? So, you know, I, th I think that's another area. Kylie, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, you know, I always think there's a study, a recent study that was done that looked at time and motion um, data for nurses. And the majority of nursing time is spent in coordination of care, not in direct patient care. Um, so one of the things that we, I always think about is, you know, when you get to that point where you have to discharge a patient, and trying to coordinate that care, particularly if that patient is going home with home care or they're going to a skilled nursing facility, 
there are a mountain of people that need to be involved in that. So similar to that idea, once that discharge order is placed, like that generates a, a spew of messages or alerts to all the people that need to be involved with that discharge. So again, that nurse isn't calling the social worker and then calling the skilled nursing facility. They're making sure the wound vac arrived and you know, helping with that coordination of care, I think would be very beneficial for lifting the load, um, that cognitive burden and just the burnout that you get when you're just dealing with mundane tasks sometimes. So that's the other thing I always think about too. I think one of the things that um, until you've used it, you don't, you don't appreciate, and that's the uh, ability to escalate. And so I think, you know, that's the, this is where now you, that whole notion of like, do I need to see if, you know, that doctor got my message or that nurse got my message or not. So if you have escalation built in, then if they don't respond at a certain time, it goes on to the next. And that's all transparent. You can see you know, that, that chain of, of events. And so, you know, I think that's the other piece. Um, and then on the flip side of that is that, um, you know, again, it's closing the loop so that you know that um, if somebody didn't take it off, it will, you can see that it's still open when you, um, you know, or you, it may come back to you as the originator of the, um, of the message or the event. So I think those are things that, um, you know, we just never had opportunities to do things like that before. And um, which makes, I think our, you know, really helps and not having this, you know, you know, because literally do worry about like, did they get the message, you know, and that then leads to stress and, uh, you know, and just you know, keeps building on the, the whole uh, burnout scenario. All right, it looks like we have time for one last question. Can you provide any advice for leveraging CCNC to facilitate clinical workflows? Well, the one thing, you know, and Kylie's really good at that, good at this, you know, we, we have a, a clinical innovation partner program and that uh, Kylie and I work together on. And I think one of the big thing about when I look at workflows is, um, you know, is mapping them out, you know, mapping out what the current state of the um, process is. And you know, usually most people have an idea of what the ideal state would be, but depending on who are all the stakeholders, they may have different perspectives on it. So it's really good to map out a workflow. Um, and what's really nice about being able to play with workflows is that you can iterate on them. And so, you know, so just because you've spent the time and come up with what you think is like the, the best laid plan, it may not be until you start, you know, actually trying it and then have the ability to um to modify it and and tweak it and i think the other big thing and i, and I know kyle will probably comment on it as well is the ability to um when you're looking at that baseline state to really get some metrics um so that you can tell if you make a change did you really make a change to the better in terms of efficiency and then also to measure satisfaction of the individuals that are involved in the process um you know because again those all weigh in kylie your thoughts yeah, I would agree, Matt. I think one of the big things when you're starting to look at that workflow is you also want to identify not only your key stakeholders, but who are your gatekeepers? Because those are the ones that are going to either make this a successful uh, transition or a not, not a so successful transition. And in the case of the ED workflow, we identified that the hospitalist was actually the gatekeeper for all the admissions, and they ended up almost being air traffic controllers and not being able to do their job. So when we took that gatekeeper where the, that bottleneck was and we moved it to the ED case managers where, who should really be managing that and being the gatekeepers for those admission consults, the process really smoothed out. So um, not only your key stakeholders, but who are your gatekeepers? And then yes, metrics, metrics, metrics. Metrics matter. You have to have the data to tell the story of a successful um, implementation. Um, we use both quantitative and qualitative data uh, in our um, workflow improvement projects that we've worked on. Yeah, and I think the, one of the most satisfying things is when you get the feedback from providers about how much that they enjoyed it. And, um, and then when you can get them to buy in like that, it just makes everything so much easier. Well, that was our last question, so we'll conclude the webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you to Matt and Kylie for the interesting and informative presentation. 
We look forward to seeing you at our next HIS Talk webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day.